the expanding universe of The Expanse has expanded to include an expansive list of gems and references. Who knew that expanding human civilization to the solar system's asteroid belt would end up being so darn complicated? Turns out the further you live from Earth, the more mad you are about, like, everything. Space politics, rogue space navies, a crew of space truckers caught in the middle. Oh, and a giant weird wormhole that everyone forgets about during their infighting. You know, your intrigue is captivating when you forget about the giant portal to the rest of the universe for most of a season. Let's see what else might have been missed. Here is an absolute truism about film and television production. If you let art and effects fill in the blanks, it will always be a hotbed for references and in-jokes. For the big finale of the sixth season, an opportunity afforded self that they decided not to waste. And picking through it was worn out sci-fi fans' pause button and easily the most talked about easter egg of the series. When the combined forces enact their big plan to take out the Free Navy's railgun, we use a reactor to power up the railguns. It involves dropping troops in individual containers to overwhelm the defenses. The screen keeping track of those troops is a who's who of sci-fi. I'd like to hear more. Deep breath now. From Star Wars, there's Trap Detector himself, Admiral Akbar. Douglas Quaid from Total Recall has left Mars to lend a hand. David Bowman has apparently given up on Hal letting him in and joined the mission from 2001. Commander Shepard from Mass Effect is on the job. Duncan Idaho is on loan from House Atreides from the Dune series. Alex Rogan from The Last Starfighter, more on him later, has been called up for duty. Jason Nesmite from Galaxy Quest is dropping in, as is Edward Buck from Halo. They join the Space Marines from Aliens, Hicks, Vasquez, and Hudson, along with, of course, Ripley. Joseph Cooper found his way from Interstellar. Josh Anderson was sent by the precogs of Minority Report. Rick Deckard is on lookout from the replicants from Blade Runner. Louise Banks from The Arrival is on hand if they need a language expert. Kevin Flynn from Tron fame has gone through the very big door to join the fray. Rob Neary from Close Encounters of the Third Kind must have carved his mashed potatoes into a railgun because he's there too. Johnny Rico from Starship Troopers is earning his citizenship. Lone Star from Spaceballs is lending his Schwartz to the fight. The rapidly descending approach probably felt familiar to Ryan Stone from Gravity. And you can't have it an away mission without William Riker from Star Trek. Narbonic creator Shane and Kay Garrity gets a nod as well, as well as crew members Ochi and Levine. Phew, that's quite the super band. Compared to that giant geek dump of sci-fi names, Christian Avasarala and her seven-pack-a-day smoky voice has a relatively modest number of name drops on her phone, but she goes for quality over quantity here. In and on to the show's reputation as Game of Thrones in space, she's got the mountain Gregor Clegane saved, and for when things get extra tricky, she can dial up Doctor Who. But look, we're all geeks here, so let's dig in. For instance, there's a lot of you yelling at the screen that his handle is the Doctor, not Doctor Who. Okay, we hear you. Except once in a non canonical movie starring Grand Moff Tarkin himself, Peter Cushing, called Doctor Who and the Daleks. This had better work. In that movie, he was Doctor Who, but he wasn't a Time Lord. He was just a scientist from Earth who made a TARDIS that kind of bumbled its way to a planet where Daleks ruled over the people there. Who wants to break it to Avasarala that she's got the discount knockoff Doctor, huh? Not it. When video games were new, it was hard to convince your parents that you weren't wasting your time and their precious quarters on something frivolous. They didn't know that video games would become a $173.1 billion industry in 2021, or that esports would even be a thing, much less come with athlete-style money. Instead, to justify all that time trying to save the people in Defender, even though they're all inevitably perished because the game has no end, you just went until you ran out of lives, joystick jockeys had the last Starfighter. The premise was that a distant alien civilization was in desperate need of a really good Starfighter gunner and sent the game out to find one. Like any good video game, the ship had a power-up weapon that sort of negated the need for a good gunner, the Death Blossom. The ship would spin around, spraying lasers everywhere, decimating the enemy fleet, but you could only use it once. On a status screen in Season 5, we see that someone in the Expanse has taken a page out of the Ryland Star League and equipped one of their ships with a Death Blossom. There's a stage musical for this movie as well, and that still haunts me. There's another name drop in Episode 10 of the fifth season this time of a real-life hero. During the attack on Pearl Harbor, Doris Dory Miller was a mess attendant on the West Virginia who leapt into action, moving injured crew members, including the captain, and manning a machine gun to defend the ship. He was awarded the Medal of Honor for the lives he saved that day, and in 2020, a new aircraft carrier was named after him that sent a launch in 2026. In the future of the Expanse, the UNN has named a ship after the hero as well, and is seen on the arrivals log screen. Miller was portrayed by Cuba Gooding Jr. in the 2001 movie Pearl Harbor. 
David Bowman must have felt right at home in that big mission at the end. Not just because he too was from a hard science fiction epic that involved discovering a portal to the rest of space, but also because both 2001 A Space Odyssey and The Expanse have similar docking displays as shown in a season 5 episode. Hopefully they don't have to negotiate with a rogue AI to get anything done. There are a lot of movies that filmmakers can be obsessed with, but the one that perhaps attracts the most attention is Stanley Kubrick's adaptation of Stephen King's The Shining. It could be the most referenced movie of all time. Even the sci-fi expanse found its way to a nod the horror suspense classic by including the iconic carpeting from the Overlook Hotel in the first episode of the fifth season. That's a good sign you should stay away from the elevators and watch out for creepy twins. <laughs> the Expanse almost went the way of Firefly and so many other high concept shows before it that weren't given the chance to build by getting the cancellation acts too early. But this time fans were able to save the show mostly because it had a big fan in Jeff Bezos. But also because Amazon already had the streaming rights in the United States for the show and was in a better position than sci-fi to recoup from the show. But it still needed fans who even flew a banner over the Amazon headquarters. The fans took to calling themselves the Screaming Firehawks after the rejected new name for the Toshi before Rossiante was settled on. In a hat tip, the Razorback in Episode 4 of Season 5 gets rechristened the Screaming Firehawk. I think that's also what my uncle called his Firebird. You get access to a whole bunch of new worlds. You gotta convince people to go colonize them. With the people you convince to go to the asteroid belt to work in open revolt over poor treatment, who wouldn't want to sign up for more space expeditions, huh? In the first episode of Season 5, an ad on a mass transit vehicle tries to convince people anyway, ending with a new life on a new world awaits you. The same pitch made by the flying billboard airships in the classic Blade Runner. You knew all those experiences would be lost like tears in the rain, though. The Simpsons traditionally don't travel well. That's especially true for the city Homer hates even more than Shelbyville, New York City. When Barney goes on a bender and leaves Homer's car there between the two towers, he has to go retrieve it, which includes waiting for a parking reinforcement officer to come by and take off the boot. His only source of sustenance while waiting is a street vendor selling cove kalosh on a stick. The made-up dish from Parts Unknown could be had with either Mountain Dew or crab juice, the latter being the less gross choice, obviously. When Amos returns to Earth, he passes a Kav Kalash vendor in a nod to the long-running series. The art crew got an early start at peppering in references, with the eighth episode of the first season having a list of ships including a few nods. Perhaps predicting their early cancellation, the Serenity appears on the list, as well as an Inquisitor ship from the miniatures game Warhammer 40k. The perhaps geekiest nod, however, goes to one of the earliest hits of the internet, Strong Bad, specifically his dragon Trogdor the Burninator, with one of the ships bearing the name Burninator. They should put some beefy arms on it for good measure. The first few episodes of The Expanse involved a bit of musical spaceships for the eventual crew of the Rociante, including boarding the Doniger before that was too attacked by mystery men. The former Canterbury crew had to make their way to the future Rociante, then called the Toshi to escape the attack. The Doniger wasn't as lucky and in a last-ditch effort was set to self-destruct. Apparently the ship was a Wayland yutani design because the self-destruct screen looked like the one on the Nostromo from Aliens. Mormons figure prominently early in the Expanse series, primarily around the Nauvoo, a generation ship meant to take a Mormon population out beyond the solar system. Mormons actually figure in a fair amount of science fiction, including the original Battlestar Galactica, where the Mormon creator based much of the culture on the 12 colonies around Mormon theology. That's largely due to the religion's history of having to find a place to worship. The Nauvoo itself is a tip to that, named after Nauvoo, Illinois, one of the first Mormon settlements after fleeing religious persecution in Missouri. There's a more lighthearted nod to the Mormons in the Expanse in posters for the Trey Parker and Matt Stone musical Book of Mormon. The graphics department was up to its usual tricks again early in the series, when Detective Miller checks a subway map for the series station. The show is about to introduce Chad Coleman as the Outer Planets Alliance leader Fred Johnson. His earlier roles as Dennis Cuddy Wise on the show The Wire gets a shout out in the form of the Cuddy Station. There's also a nod to Planet Express accountant from Futurama in the form of Hermes Square. When The Expanse was at least partially a gritty high-tech noir about a detective in space that wore a noir detective hat in space for whatever reason, there was a bar that called out the genre in its name, Tech Noir. That wasn't just a bot of self-awareness, though. It's also the club that Sarah Connor ducks into when she's thinking she's running from Kyle Reese, but she's really running from the Terminator. The Venn diagram between fans of fantasy and science fiction and prog rock is almost just a circle. Even Led Zeppelin had songs about Vikings and the Lord of the Rings. 
For the creators of The Expanse, though, their clear favorite is the Canadian prog rock trio Rush. In the opening shot of the third season, there's an image of a bolt and nut floating in space, replicating the cover to Rush's album Counterparts, which has the song Alien Shore about coming together despite superficial differences and reaching the alien shore, comparing that evolution to the first creatures to crawl out of the water. Oh, but it doesn't stop there. We said they were fans. The name of the ship, Rociante, is not only the name of Don Quixote's horse, translating roughly formally a working horse, but it's also the name of the ship in the song Cygnus X1 Book 1, about a ship, the Rociante, heading to a black hole named Cygnus X1 in the Cygnus constellation. Like I said, lots of crossover between science fiction and fantasy and progressive rock. Still not done though, oh no, they are fans. The three drones on the Rossi are Pert, Lee, and Lifeson, named for Neil Pert, Getty Lee, and Alex Lifeson, who make up the band Rush. If you got through all of that without getting Tom Sawyer stuck in your head, congratulations, I did not. Belters have distinct neck and body tattoos that are meant to be an homage to the earliest people to mine the asteroid belt, who were sent out with cheap and faulty equipment, including suits with bad seals. This meant that their skin in certain places, especially around the neck, would be partially exposed to the vacuum leaving scarring. The belters wear those tattoos as a reminder of how disposable they are to the inners. There's a little extra in the tattoos for Joseph and Oksana, part of a polyamorous family and a crew of the DeWalt. To demonstrate their closeness, they were given tattoos that reflect each other's. Aww. By season two, Holden has already been through a lot, and he's got at least three seasons to go. In the episode, Holden and Naomi have to do a spacewalk, where the two longtime crewmates have a heart-to-heart, -heart, with Naomi worried about Holden after surviving exposure to radiation, which he's sad to report did not give him superpowers. I mean, it works that way in the Marvel Universe, come on. She notes that he masks his concern in troubling situations by asking inappropriate questions. To alleviate her concern, he asks if she likes space gladiator movies. That's a reference to the parody movie Airplane and a running gag of a character asking people if they like gladiator movies as a roundabout way of asking about their orientation. The Expanse has some high-profile fans, and not just the richest man in the world. George R. R. Martin has come out in favor of the show, as well as superfan, special effects artist, and Mythbuster Adam Savage. Savage appeared in a cameo early in the series, but he's had an even bigger impact on the show. The company tasked with maintenance on UNN ships is Savage Industries, a direct nod to the myth-busting builder who's known for saying, I reject your reality and substitute my own. The Expanse is based on a series of books and short stories by Daniel Abram and Ty Frank under the pen name James S.A. Corey. It was originally meant to be a game, but once they started building out the world, they decided it was actually a book. The audiobook narration for many of the books comes from noted audiobook narrator Jefferson Mays. In the episode Pyre, the voiceover artist gets a shout out in the form of the freighter that carries Prax to the Tycho station is named Jefferson May. The inciting incident that gets the narrative of the Expanse rolling is when the crew of the ice hauler Canterbury responds to a distress call that turns out to be a trap to lure ships in as part of an elaborate plan to kick off a war. The ship that sent the signal was the Scalopi, which should have been a dead giveaway. Scalopi is the set of islands where the Sirens lived, who would lure ships in with their songs only to have them dashed against the rocks. It's like they wanted to be caught. It seems like getting rid of one outer planet leader just leads to an even worse one. Marcos Inaro sends up the leader of the Free Navy and ups the ante by hurling asteroids at the Earth, and there just aren't enough Bruce Willis's out there to stop them. Marcos ends up acting more like a conqueror than a freedom fighter, though, specifically like Alexander the Great. His flagship, Pella, is the name of Alexander's birthplace. At Gagamela, Alexander was able to overcome an overwhelming opponent, much like Anaros did in the episode of the same name against Earth and Mars. There's a bit of a generational flip in Philip, Anaros' son. Alexander's father, Philip, was the second of Macedonia. Also like Alexander, Anaros had lots of plans for war, but not many for what to do with the places he conquered. Missiles and machine guns are the main currency of the space battles in the Expanse, but outside of chucking asteroids, the weapon that requires its own specific strategy is the railgun. Railguns require meetings and plans to get around. They're the big hush weapon on a ship. They're part of what makes the Doniger class so daunting. If you've got a cool weapon, you gotta give it a cool name. And on the Doniger ships, the railgun is called the Foe Hammer. Pretty straightforward, also naturally a reference. In The Lord of the Rings, Gandalf wields a sword with a name, because all cool swords have names. His is Glamdring, which is elvish for Foe Hammer. It's a popular reference, even appearing in Halo. And a heavy metal band. I didn't know there was one, I just assumed and sure enough. 
I mean, it's a great name for a heavy metal band, and heavy metal has the same or more crossovers as prog rockers. Seriously though, the solar system was so into fighting each other, but meanwhile on the other side of the ring, they're discovering creatures that can create zombies and no one wants to stop a moment and go, wait, what? There's a pet cemetery planet? Let's not go there. <laughs>